Hi, my name is Kathleen Flanagan, and I am going to be presenting how Americans learn to be Americans, or how one young American a long time ago now in unique circumstances learned to be American. And many years later, remembered those circumstances in an attempt to understand the country we live in. I'm a poet and I've been moved to write about the American experience for probably a dozen years. I write about a lot of different things, but I keep coming back to this, this subject that's very close to my heart. And I think one of the reasons it's become important to me is because I'm getting older. I am now 60 years old. I have lived a better part of a century. And because of that, I've seen my country change. And I've seen it make, make turns that take me away from the America that I knew as a child. I'm gonna be drawing from poems from two collections, Plume, uh, which came out in 2012, which is about basically a memoir and poems about growing up next to and working at the Hanford nuclear site in southeastern Washington. And also reading from my new book, Post Romantic, which just came out this fall. They're both from University of Washington Press. Post Romantic is about a broad range of subjects. But one of those subjects is definitely this idea of growing up in America and how we learn to be Americans. This all sort of happened in Richland, Washington, which is the bedroom community for the Hanford nuclear site. And if you're not familiar with Hanford, it was part of the Manhattan Project of World War II, where the first full-scale nuclear reactors were built in the world. And product, there was plutonium produced for not only the Trinity bomb, the very first atomic bomb, and this bomb that destroyed Nagasaki, but something like two thirds of our American nuclear arsenal was produced at the Hanford site. And that was the company town, the company that we all worked for. This is a photograph of Richland, Washington, probably 15 years or so before I was born. Um, the trees were bigger, but the houses looked exactly the same. And my neighborhood was just probably two blocks from this picture and looked just like this. And all of our houses were identical, which was kind of like our town. We were all families. It was a monoculture mostly young families, lots of kids, very few single people, very few older people, hardly any cemeteries. Um, you had overwhelmingly a white population and that monoculture sort of defined our existence. Um, we called ourselves the Adam Buston village of the West, if you can believe that. A lot of these photos come from the Hanford Declassified Document Portal, uh, which is now defunct. But I was able to um, mine a bunch of really interesting photographs of my hometown from this government site. And as in this one, here's a picture of a hardware store that I remember from childhood. It gives you a sense of the of the prosperity and the cleanliness and the newness of the town that I grew up in. But it also has a sort of sheen of strangeness to it. I, I think of this photo and it looks to me like every single person in it is staged, like they've been asked to do what it is they're doing by the photographer. And that, that feels sort of emblematic as well. So I'm gonna be floating a few lessons for you that I learn. Uh, the idea about how Americans become Americans. And lesson one is Americans learn by consuming. I grew up the child of two depression era parents. And so they had a very strong moral code about, yes, they wanted new things, they wanted nice things, but there was a sense of what might be too much of a good thing. So I like to picture myself in this photo as a, as a kid sitting in the child seat of that grocery cart 
rolling past aisle after aisle of choice and abundance, but understanding too that there's this limit on what we can have. And that to me is very American, the idea of so many choices, but either having for some moral or, or economic reasons, not being able to have exactly and everything that you want. This is an example of a couple of magazines that would have been in our house when I was a kid. And again, I think this communicates very beautifully that desire for new things, for modernity, but also a kind of modesty that went with it. And that extended into books and that extended into children's books. This is a page that I have lifted from one of my childhood books called My Prayers. And I think it's fun to think about the fact I never read the prayers because I couldn't read, but I love the pictures. And the pictures were very much like this one, all of them. Some blonde boy or girl looking longingly at some American scene. This was my favorite picture because the trees were old and the houses looked so comfortable and really not very much like my town, but like what an American town should look like. And that inspired this first poem I'm going to share with you called A Child's Book of America. By the time I could read its title, My Prayers, I'd already learned religion from my favorite illustration inside, a blonde girl gazing from a hilltop at her American town below. American because of the white church and wide streets, and because under the gabled roofs, the artist implied garden rakes and comfortable rooms pungent with furniture wax and clocks that chimed, and in the kitchen, butter on a dish, and in the closet, a button jar, and dozens of bright spools of thread. I resolved to be just the same, blonde, with a clock in the hall, and a father who came home to dinner served in clouds of steam. I learned America is a religion, and praying feels like envy. The spirit has moved me again and again. Lesson two, we learn from the patriotism and emotions of others. And I would say my primary teacher growing up was my father. He was a veteran of World War II and he expressed his citizenship through very typical uh, 20th century methods. He, he campaigned and canvassed for his favorite candidates. He volunteered for civic or organizations. My dad and I actually shared a room in a sense. My bedroom when I was very young was also my dad's office. And this was a picture of General George C. Marshall uh, hanging on my bedroom wall. And at some point when I was old enough to express it, I asked him to please take this picture down because General Marshall's ear would grow at night and it scared me, which is, a lead into this next poem called General George C. Marshall, author of the Marshall Plan's Left Ear. In childhood, in the half light of my door ajar, the general's portrait on my bedroom wall glowed and his left ear grew by borrowing light from a white stripe in the American flag behind him, transforming it into a kind of receiver or spying device that tapped my dreams. So I was afraid, but my father hesitated to take the picture down, explaining it had to do with saving Europe after the war. This is what I understood, my fear budging against my father's love for a man who merged at night with the stars and stripes, something to do with allegiance something to do with light and dark. Lesson three, we learn to carry the news. Lesson four, and where to bury it. In my childhood, it wasn't phones, it was the radio, but the radio was on and I would hear the news 
that I was not really set up to comprehend. And the, the angst and anxiety in that news has to go somewhere in a child's mind. And so I would actually pin it to something I saw or, or something. Yeah, often it would be something like this magazine cover. So I, I remember visiting my grandmother's house when I was small and she had this stack of magazines, old time magazines. And I remember going through it, just looking at the pictures and seeing this particular cover and being so frightened of it, so afraid of what it seemed to communicate to me that I stuffed the magazine back in the pile and put the pile back in the very back of the china closet where I could feel it for years afterwards without looking at it. I knew it was there, but I didn't want to look at it. Similarly, there was an art book on the living room table in our house, and there was a particular picture by Georges Brock that I thought was too scary to look at. It somehow seemed to collect all the anxiety that I felt from the newspapers or the magazines, the radio, and it seemed to sort of soak that up. So that is a lead into this next poem, A Childhood Fear of Georges Brock. She confused the art book on the living room table with daily headlines shouting Soviet Union, conflated Brock's masterpiece, Man with a Guitar, and the TV newscaster's phrase, The Iron Curtain. The bricked and mortared man on the page somehow conveyed without hands or mouth or guitar the rat-a-tat of a radio bulletin. The painting's industrial grays, browns, and black, and menacing light from above, the unnerving expression of every side at once collided with the post-atomic world. She memorized its page number. If it's true the young have ignorance to shield them, then for a while she could hide from men on TV ducking into black sedans, missile counts, and newspapers crawling with words. The image in plate 13 didn't ask her to understand. It asked only for fear. Um, we are living in, in a great sort of abundance of bad news, it seems to me right now. But I think uh, growing up in the 60s and 70s was also a time of tumult. And these are just some of the examples of news stories that were all around me as I was a, a very small kid growing up. This There's the assassinations of Martin Luther King and Bobby Kennedy. There were the nightly death counts on the national news from the Vietnam War. And there were stories like the um, massacre at Kent State of college students who looked like my own brothers. So I think one of the things looking back I see about myself is the way I kind of created a representative American to sort of contain my anxiety, and to sort of be the strong one for me. Um, I have a long poem in my new book called Letter to Rilke, and this is just a section of that, of that poem. And it's a description of that American man who seemed to hold the country on his shoulders. And a lot of this was, was inarticulate to me. It was just a feeling I had. An everyman, bystander, scapegoat, citizen, racist, chosen one, extra, blur at the edge of the frame, peripheral man. I studied him in the hardware store where he studied the penny nails. I studied him on the highway as we passed and his hands at 10 and two. I studied him on the news, blasted by a fire hose or standing back to watch it happen or bracing the hose as it blasted away. I studied him on the convention floor with fellow delegates or fellow strikers, aiding or aiming in the uniform of the National Guard. 
on a stool in a diner, drinking coffee alone from the low angle of a child. That man is gone now. If I call to him, he isn't here to answer. He is what's missing. Lesson six. Inside our American ideals, we find a community where we feel we fit. Sometimes we're born to our community. Sometimes we have to go in search of it. I was born into a community, a kind of uh, tribe called Richland, Washington. Richland is not like your ordinary hometown. It was a company town and there was a very distinct set of them and us. I was born to be an us, which felt very comforting but there were a lot of rules about us. Us meant the scientists and workers at Hanford. It meant the people who believed in what happened at Hanford. And them was anyone who questioned that. And I didn't understand what any of this really meant as a very young kid, but I did fully comprehend this idea of we belonged together and we were different together. This is a cartoon, I think from the 1940s, but it felt like it could apply to the time when I was a kid. Pop, how far are we from the United States? I had this strong sense that we were part of America in that we were helping to protect America. This was something that was in the air around me that we kept America safe. And yet we never appeared in the news. No one ever talked about Hanford or the Tri-Cities or my town of Richland. It didn't seem to be part of the American fabric um, when I looked at, uh, at magazines and newspapers and television. Lesson seven, we learn a baseline set of community values. You're sort of bathed in it. You're swimming in the values of your neighbors and hometown. This picture, by the way, is of the Richland Big Pool where I probably spent most of the hours of most of the days of my childhood summers. Lesson eight, we learn norms from our neighbors. And the norms in Richland were different than other places. This billboard says it all. Silence means security, protection for all, don't talk. Silence was valued above all other values uh, in my hometown. And you can even see the kids there in the window, they're being protected by their dad's silence. So, you know, it was very famous in our town that dads never talked about work. Uh, no one really talked about what happened at Hanford and kids didn't really know. Um, but this somehow was, it was conveyed to us that that helped keep us all safe. This is a picture of the 300 area where my dad worked. It's the site that was closest to the city of Richland. And I knew very little about Hanford, but I did know that not very many other people's towns had silver test reactor domes at the edge of town. And the word atomic was everywhere in my town. And atomic meant American. It meant new and improved. It meant scientific. Uh, and we would see atoms all over the place. There was an atom on the city seal. There was this atom on the top of the uh, movie theater marquee. The bowling alley was called atomic bowling lanes. So for me, it was a very positive word. It wasn't until I was maybe, I'm guessing high school, before I saw a picture like this one of the, of the sort of factory element of Hanford and how they were producing a product and that that product was plutonium. We, we just didn't know. Which doesn't mean that kids don't speculate about what goes on out there. We called it the area and we thought that maybe there were, we had heard rumors that there were beagles out there being um, tested and that they were smoking cigarettes to see if 
cigarettes caused lung cancer. Lesson nine, we learned our identities have an assigned value. And again, I thought of myself as part of that us of the Hanford community. Uh, and though I was not really contributing very much, I felt an identity with, with that world. And frankly, there was a kind of superiority that went along with it. We're doing this great thing for the country. We are patriots and we uh, seem to know better than other people about whether it's, it's good for them or not. This photo was taken next to a mobile whole body counter. Um, and this laboratory actually visited every single elementary school in our town. And every single kid in every elementary school went through the, the, the mobile whole body counter uh, in order to provide data for some, for some research that none of us ever knew the results of. So this poem is called Whole Body Counter, Marcus Whitman Elementary and begins with an epigraph from Health Physics Magazine. The mobility of this new laboratory provides versatile capabilities for measuring internally deposited gamma ray emitting radionuclides in human beings. We were warned to shut our eyes. Everyone was school age now, our kindergarten teacher reminded us, old enough to follow directions and do a little for our country. My turn came and the scientists strapped me in and a steady voice prompted, the counter won't hurt, lie perfectly still. And mostly I did and imagined what children pretend America is. Parks bordered by feathery evergreens, lawns so green and lush, they soothe the eyes and pupils open like love. A whole country of lawns like that. Just once I peeked and the machine had taken me in like a spaceship, and I moved slow as the sun through the chamber's smooth steel sky. I shut my eyes again and pledged to be still, so proud to be a girl America could count on. Lesson 10, history explains us to ourselves. And that's obviously true of every human experience, but I think in America, it might be especially true. I have a memory. I was probably seven years old and we were visiting my, my cousins in Portland. They had a brand new color television set. And there was, a, there was an active explosion on the screen, very much like what you're seeing here. And while the rest of my brothers and cousins were running around, my aunts and aunt and uncle and parents were talking, I was glued to the color TV and I heard for the first time an expression I'd never heard before, atomic bomb. I knew obviously what atoms were and I knew they were great, but I had never heard of an atomic bomb. And what was shocking to me is that I knew immediately that this had had to have something to do with Richland and that I was somehow implicated in this bomb. This poem I'm going to share with you is in a form called a palindrome, which means it's the same going forward as backward. And the reason I chose this form for this poem is I think of this moment as a moment of clarity, but also as a moment of before and after understanding that we have the capacity to destroy ourselves. Afternoon's wide horizon. That mushroom cloud filling my cousin's color TV stained orange, what remained black and white at home. The atomic age had been a fond friend where I lived in atomic city. The atom had something to do with who I was. Now the sky on screen filled with fire. What is that? I asked. What is that? I asked the sky on screen filled with fire. 
who I was now had something to do with where I lived in Atomic City. The Adam, the Atomic Age had been a fond friend. What remained black and white at home? My cousin's color TV stained orange, that mushroom cloud filling afternoon's wide horizon. Lesson 11, the privileged learn to ignore. I think about a moment in the kitchen with my mother when I asked her why there were so many more black people in Pasco and so few in Richland. And I remember she had an answer. She said, well, a lot of the black people have, have come out from the South and with the railroad. And since that's where the railroad is in Pasco, that's where they live. And that was an answer that I understood. And I didn't, I didn't really ask anything more beyond that, but I remembered it. And I never thought to ask why there were no black people in Kennewick, the third of the Tri-Cities. Um, and it wasn't until much later that I understood that government housing in Richland did not allow black people to have homes in Richland. There were very few. And it wasn't until probably 10 years ago that I learned that Kennewick was a sundown town, which means that black people were not allowed to live in Richland, in, in Kennewick, and were not allowed in the city after the sun went down. I had the privilege of not knowing that information, and that isn't really possible anymore. It is not appropriate, and it's something that I think is typical of a certain kind of American experience that we turn our back on what we don't want to know, especially when the facts are at odds with our favorite beliefs. Now, when I was growing up in, the, in Richland, we knew that Hanford was a safe place, that radiation did not leak from the site, that there was no environmental impact from the work they did there. Nevertheless, the people who lived downstream and downwind, who were later named the downwinders, experienced elevated levels of health risks. That little girl on the right, she and her sister both died of thyroid cancer in their 50s. And people in the tribes along the Columbia River, especially at Celilo Falls, uh, and who used a lot of fish in their diets, they experienced health problems associated with radiation poisoning. But because we were taught not to think that happened, it didn't happen. Lesson 12, we learn loyalty to our forebears. This man is wearing a high school t-shirt, which says Richland Bombers on it. And that mushroom cloud coming out of the letter R is called the R cloud. And that is the mascot of the Richland Bomber team. Um, it's kind of shocking for anyone from outside of Richland to imagine that your high school mascot could be an atomic bomb. and I think at best you can think about it as a kind of tone deafness to the way this might feel or seem to people outside of Richland. At worst, I think it's, it's intentionally uh, objectionable, uh, offensive. And the only thing I can say about it to make someone try to understand or to understand it myself is that this comes out of a kind of loyalty to our parents' generation. This picture on the left is actually from National Geographic magazine. Um, the picture on the right is just drawn from the local Tri-City Herald, just the sports pages. Um, what we need to remember is that my parents' generation built Hanford from nothing, where there had been nothing but desert or farms there was built a nuclear arsenal in 13 months of, of um, working from scratch. And that that 
is something that created a change in world history. And so you can imagine there's a lot of pride around that, despite the fact that Hanford is now the most contaminated waste site in our hemisphere and the largest environmental cleanup in the entire world. So there's this mix, this push and pull of fear and pride, but it plays itself out in that high school mascot. We are loyal to our generation, our parents' generation. Lesson 13, we learned to trust America. And I think we learned to trust America because to learn not to trust America is too frightening. It isn't really something we can afford. I grew up in the Cold War, which was a very scary time, although I can't say that it was any less or more scary than what we're living through now. Um, but this poem is an attempt to convey what that time was like. The Cold War. It will turn quaint soon enough. Bomb shelters already charm us, stuffed to their low ceilings with batteries, board games, and cans. Sardines are amusing, and pineapple rings for dessert. Old footage of duck and cover drills inspires us to be world-weary and ironic, to embrace the futile. Once we considered A-bombs big, then H-bombs exploded over the South Pacific. We can laugh now at Khrushchev and his shoe, beauty queens in radiation suits. I'd wake bolt upright in my bed, afraid of a flash to come. I'd buy books and extra spaghetti to provide for our last days and pray that our end be painless. I wasn't even that young. I remember the red phone and missile codes, how every movie hinged on a clock ticking down. We called it the arms race and there were two sides. It was simple. Lesson 14, our emotions confuse landscape for country. And maybe this is personal for me, but I think it's a rule I think that can go across, uh, across to other people too. I grew up in Eastern Washington where the landscape was very dry and dramatic. I would say it was not my kind of landscape. I am much more attuned to the landscape on the west side of the mountains. I live in Seattle now and I, I love the green and the blue and the rain, but I very much feel this sense of identity with the landscape of the Pacific Northwest and I adore it. And I can't help but mix that up with my sense of what America is. I'm going to share this poem called A Museum of a Lost America. And it, it is, this is a sort of mature looking back at um, the country and what I've come to understand by thinking about Hanford and thinking about um, my, Ameri my American experience. I run a gloved hand over my country like a curator, ready to frame what my mother and father passed down. My country, like bolts and bolts of fine-gauged fabric unfurled in the wind that never touched the weeds and dirt, not once. And I was possessive of it, like mother love. Imagine owning in turn the four cardinal directions, orchard in bloom, crickets at dark, wheat up to the ridge, fence line in snow. Now I practice saying, I've confused the landscape for my country and my country for the landscape and add it to my losses, my sheep-like devotion to my shepherd that I've kept as long as I could. My country of heroes, country of Lincoln, country of fallen soldiers who didn't need to ask what America is, country of short memory, glass surfaces and fingerprints easily wiped off. Country of bombs bursting, anthems and fireworks, hand on my heart. Please advise, should I hang portraits of my mother and father in this hall? 
They're lost. They taught me this love, but how it would hurt them to see it soiled. I know somehow it's my failure, my fault, that my own country betrayed me. Oh, beautiful, I will not stop. I cling to any shred of America remaining, like a monkey taken from her mother and clinging to a mother made of cloth. Lesson 15 is we learn to reinvent ourselves and then to forget who we were. Um, and I'm gonna ask Elle if maybe she could switch over to the tab of uh, a, a poetry video that I have um, collaborated on with my daughter. Or let me see, I can do it. And this is uh, my last poem that I'm gonna be sharing. This is called The 90s. And one of the things that it is dealing with is that idea of reinventing ourselves and forgetting who we were. I hope you enjoy it. The 90s. We remodel the house, the shape of a world war, tore away the McCarthyism and curse words in the basement, repealed the breezeway like an amendment to the Constitution. We carpeted the civil defense bomb shelter tile, replaced the monitor and Merrimack furnace, painted over the state institutional pink and dirty green of dead presidents. We dug out boxes of torn tweed coats, worn to hotels with brass registers and bellboys that burned to the ground before we were born, and dresses with secret stitchings, ancient Kleenex balled in their sleeves, and in their pockets, rancid lipsticks and gold metal tubes, then hauled them away to make a house for ourselves, a shelter from the past, an Ernst Hardware showcase for our valuables, modem jacks, imitation Chihuly glass, Costco boxes. We swept away the planting and picking, the prayers poking up like rusty mattress springs, the ragamuffin children running down the road. Our new appliances didn't speak or we didn't listen. Okay, so before I do anything else, I want to make sure to thank um, Margaret and Elle for, for this great festival, um, the Jola Boca Flood Book Festival. And um, I, I want to see um, if there's any questions. Oh, it's the awkward silence while it gets going. So let's see. There we go. So Olmsted in Seattle is a book that I worked on um, the last few years. And I've been involved with Olmsted Parks in Seattle oh, for thanks. about 13 years um, since I got involved with the. There we go. Sorry about that. So odd to see the architecture and clothing from my early childhood. Yeah, no kidding. Um, I think it's amazing that we can go back and find records of our childhoods in government documents. I, I think that's kind of an unusual um, benefit of living in a place like Richland. <laughs> the general's ear does grow, in fact, yeah. Uh, that was, again, I have to thank my daughter, Elizabeth Flinnick, and she, she did the Photoshop that allows you to see that ear become a glowing thing. Oh, okay, yeah, I have a giveaway. Uh, I have, so a copy of both Plume and uh, Post Romantic, which I would love to give to someone who might be interested in sharing a poem that they like to share with other people. 
Oh yeah. That's a good one. Stopping by woods. That is a beautiful book. In fact, I have a children's version. I don't know if you've seen that, but there is a children's book version of it. It has wonderful illustrations. It's a great one to share at Christmas time with kids. <laughs> yes, and The Snitches is also a great book of poetry to share with, <laughs> with, other, with other people. I agree. Yeah, there was that. There was a movie that we saw too. Our friend the Adam, which made it very approachable and friendly, and uh, that was definitely emphasized throughout the American culture in the '60s, '50s, and '60s. The idea that the Adam is our friend; it will allow us to do things we've never been able to do before, and that you know, I think we've sort of evolved our our sense of what the atom means. <laughs> I, do, I, uh, I do think that the, um, the school mascot is unlikely to change in the near future. And I believe the reason is because of this loyalty for uh, the generations that came before us. Um, you can imagine this this push and pull of pride and fear that comes out of having parents who devoted their entire careers and lives to a spot that is contaminated, the most contaminated site in the in the hemisphere. But this idea that it it is associated with so much fear and concern. Um, and so there's, we have these ways of coping. And I think one of the ways that we cope is to look at the positive side of it, the incredible creation. And, you know, we've created a, a myth around this, you know, the birth of the bomb. And often the way the story is told in Richland is it sort of ends at the end of World War II. And it's as though the Cold War never happened, that nothing else can besmirch that, that victory. And that's where the story ends. Well, I would love to give this this set of books to Heather C. So if Heather C. can uh, provide her information, I'll be happy to send those books off to her. And I want to thank you all so much for watching. It's been such a pleasure. Next up is Charm City, historical settings that transport the reader with Anna Brazil, Edie Kay, and C.V. Lee. And I hope you will watch that one as well. And thank you so much for being here. And thanks so much to Ellen, Margaret.